Howdy, this is Mackenzie Franklin from Side Game LLC here in Colorado Springs, Colorado. And today we're going to be talking about my top 10 board games from 2016. So this is five years ago. This is around the time when I really started to getting heavy into the hobby, started actually purchasing board games for the collection on a consistent basis, and something that I thought that, man, board games I think are going to be a big part of my life. So I really like the games that came from this year, and I still see myself playing some that came out to this day. So fantastic year. Let's go ahead and jump into the list with number 10. Now, number 10 is going to be the game Millennium Blades. Now, this one actually I played fairly recently when the Collusion expansion came out. Millennium Blades has you playing as a CCG player, so think something like Magic the Gathering or Yu-Gi-Oh!, but in this game, the world is all about trading cards, so it's more like an anime than it is anything else. So you have your own deck of cards that you'll be creating and changing, and you're going to do that by going to tournaments and shops and whatnot, and eventually you'll take that deck that you've curated and bring it to a tournament, and in the tournament, everybody's going to be doing a very simplified game, uh, kind of game within a game, and doing your best to score the most points, essentially, during this uh, tournament. And then if you win the tournament, you get promos and whatnot, and you're just trying to do your best in these consecutive tournaments, and hopefully craft and, you know, really make your decks amazing. This really does a good job at mimicking the experience of a CCG, and I think it does a great job playing on lots of puns for the world of all this, you know, anime, gaming in general. And I think it's really fun. Uh, it's a game that I think just breathes flavor, breathes life, and I love the cooperative version of this with the uh, set rotation expansion. Now, my favorite part of this game has to be the just buying cards from a deck. It's a card shop, right? There's a whole bunch of stacks of cards that you could pick from. And whenever you buy one of these packs of cards, you only look at the rare card. And it's just you're hoping for something that'll work your deck. You kind of have an idea of what's going to be in each pack of cards. But ultimately, you're really just hoping for something that'll work well. You can always sell it afterwards if it's not something you actually need. But Oh my gosh, this is just so fun. I love that rush, that feeling of opening a fresh booster pack, and I think this one does it really well. So that's my number 10, Millennium Blades. Number nine goes to the game Ice Cool, a wonderful family game where you play as penguins. Penguins attending ice school. And when you're in your schooling system here, you are getting hungry. So you're actually going to skip class and do your best to try to pick up all of these, you know, these fish that are around the different schooling areas, the different rooms. So your job is to get your little penguin character under these doors. And when you do, you catch the fish. Now, be careful, though. There is going to be a hall monitor that's going to be chasing you. So this hall monitor is going to be doing its best in order to catch you and if the hall monitor catches everyone then it's over we switch and then someone else becomes the hall monitor once everybody's been the hall monitor game's over but you're going to be doing your best to really navigate these corridors and scoop up all your fish. Now, my favorite part of this game is actually the way that the penguins move. I think it's really neat how you simply flick the piece. It's going to move around. You can hit it on its head to make it jump. You can do some curves by hitting it on their sides. There's a lot of neat trick shots you can do, and you can see people who are really good at this game. And I think it's really cool. It's kind of a balancing factor for all ages. This is very much a flicking dexterity game, but a fun one and one that's a blast. I also really like that you can combine it with the sequel, Ice Cold 2, to make some gigantic mazes and just have a blast going around and catching fish. It is a great time. So that's my number nine, Ice Cool. Now number eight goes to the game Junk Art. Now Junk Art is another dexterity game, but this one focuses heavily on stacking and putting kind of shapes together. Now the premise of the game is you are a junk artist and you're going to be traveling around the world to three places, participating in different events and art fairs around the world. Now this is done through the use of little cards and these cards will tell you what the scenario is. So it's scenario based, which is really neat. So it's going to be different each time you play. And then you're going to use these cards that are in the center here that match the different pieces. So it's a card driven dexterity game where the objectives and the wind conditions change each time. And I think that's really awesome. You're able to use all these really funky pieces in unique ways, and you're able to really create some interesting pieces of art. I love that the, sh the shapes here are all just funkily shaped enough, but they still have some commonalities between them where they can fit in nicely. Now, my favorite part of this game has to be just the camaraderie and the different scenarios that, you know, uh, draw you to do different things. In some scenarios, you're trying to not make anything fall. In some scenarios, you are trying to set up your statue and then you'll switch your statue with the other person. So you want to make sure that it's something that's going to be difficult for them. There's a lot to love with the different interactions that come from the scenarios. And I think that this one is a dexterity winner. One of my favorites in the genre. So that's number eight, Junk Art. Number seven goes to the game When I Dream. Now, this game is extremely special and a fantastic party game, and one of the best, honestly, with this uh, deduction kind of word style games. In the game, you play as either a fairy, a boogeyman, 
the Sandman or the Dreamer. The Dreamer is going to be being fed clues by the people at the table and doing their best to try to answer and guess what the clue card's referring to. So if you're getting C here, people might tell you something like water, ocean, underwater, things like that. Things that are going to help you guess it. However, there are people that are on different teams. The fairy wants to make sure that the Dreamer is getting them right. The boogeyman, though, wants to make sure they get them wrong. So they have to be crafty and clever in their clues to try to lead the Dreamer away. There's also the Sandman who's trying to get an even split of the two. It's really interesting, really unique. And I love how, as the Dreamer, not only are you trying to just guess the words, but you're also trying to figure out, based on the player count and the number of people at the table, who is actually telling you the truth and who can you trust. It's really funny when uh, the Dreamer believes in the Boogeyman and starts to kind of go on their side. I love that dynamic and that tension of who do I actually trust here? And being clever with the clues is so cool. My favorite part is definitely the different roles. I think that it's a blast either, you know, working for them and seeing how your clues maybe don't pan out or do pan out and you feel really good when it does. Or if you are the Sandman, I think that role is the most interesting where you're trying to get an equal balance of good and bad clues. So a fantastic word party game with lots of uh, chaos. Super fun. This is When I Dream, my number seven. Now, my number six is going to be Exit the Game. Now, this really got me into the escape room style games. Uh, the game Time Stories was one that I really enjoyed because of the puzzles that it included. And Exit, I think, is the best version of this puzzle style game. It strips down pretty much everything else outside of the puzzles and just gives you puzzle after puzzle after puzzle that are all really cool and really challenging. Now, Exit is going to put you in lots of different scenarios. This one's a secret lab. No spoilers here, but this is what you'll see. You'll have a wheel, you'll have some clue cards, and then you'll have puzzle cards. So you're going to be going from thing to thing, unlocking things, solving puzzles, and using the wheel here to give your answers. I really like this system. And the best part about the game is you actually use the box and you're going to need scissors and a pen because you're actually going to potentially destroy and modify components that are in the box. Now, that does mean that this game is a one-time use, but I think that really opens it up to some really interesting puzzles. Now, that is my favorite part are the puzzles. I love the creativity that goes into these boxes. And if I were to recommend one of these, I would honestly recommend the first one, the Abandoned Cabin. I think there's a lot of smart stuff happening there. But if you're looking for something for a little bit more difficult and interesting, if you do like the story side, I really like the murder on the Orient Express. It's so neat. They weave in a story into all the clues, and they do a great job with keeping the puzzle still really exciting and cool. So really like this one. That's my number six, Exit the Game. My number five is going to go to the game Role Player. Now, Role Player here is a wonderful dice drafting game. You play as a character creator, so you're going to be making a character to take into an RPG, but you never actually make it to that RPG, but you do fight some creatures along the way, particularly with the expansions. So in this game, you're going to be drafting dice, and these dice will be on initiative cards. So the higher the dice you draft, the lower you go on the initiative track, which not a big deal. If you're playing with the expansions, though, there's some cool stuff that can change with that, with these fiend cards. But basically, the worse the die, the faster you go in the turn order in case there's an item or something you really want to buy. So the, the turn sequence is fairly simple. You get a die, you put it somewhere on your board, every die you take is going to trigger an ability, and then you can go to the market and buy something or fight a creature, which will help you prepare for this final boss at the end. Now, I think this game is best with the expansions. I think that the monster at the end gives you something that you're working towards, and I think it's very thematic, very fun, and I like the minions along the way, giving you extra options for modifications with their experience points that you can earn. But I do just like this regular system of lining up the dice. Now my favorite part about this game has to be the cards. I love that each card has you have to evaluate it right then and there. I love the trait cards. You can see them on the bottom here, these blue ones. They're going to give you alternate ways to score, which usually you're going to need to do if you're trying to win the game, which I think is really fun and really challenging because a lot of these cards are going to give you some really interesting restrictions that are going to affect the entire way you play. And I love that about this game. I love the choice. I love how you're committing to things early on, and I love how each decision is going to give you a little bonus each time you do it. I really like this style. And I do recommend you get the expansions for this game. I think both are wonderful. I really like the Fiends and Familiar expansion as it adds the Fiend cards, which make the higher dice even more punishing as opposed to just going last. And it gives you some more incentive to picking lower dice because of the Fiend and the Familiars, where you, can, you want small dice in order to power up their abilities. So I like it, the dynamic dice choices. I really like this one. That is Role Player, my number five. My number four is going to go to the game Great Western Trail. In Great Western Trail, you play as a cowboy, but not like a shoot 'em up, bang bang cowboy. A hey, I got to get some cattle, 
drive them to Kansas City, and then ship them to try to make the most money as possible. This is like a very interesting take on this genre, which I think is really, really cool. Now, the game is by one of my favorite designers, Alexander Pfister, and his whole shtick is he has this awesome system for a lot of his games where you have a character, you move him around, you do something at a place, and it's a very simple turn sequence. So there's just a lot of iconography with the different things you can interact with, but that's where the choices come from are these different interaction points. And it's on display here very, very well. So I really like the way this is set up. Turn structure is very simple. You're going to move your character, activate the location you land at, and then draw back up to your hand size. It's so straightforward, so simple. But the game itself, my favorite part, has to be the way the board changes. So as you play, you're going to get these carpenters, and these carpenters are going to allow you to build buildings. And when you build buildings, you actually increase the amount of spaces on the board, so it's going to take longer for everybody to go around, but you're also building your own private buildings, which is really cool. You can set up toll booths, you can set up effects that are just going to be really powerful, you can set up things that are going to be extra turns, and positioning is very key because you want to try to make sure that your trail down here is super smooth and super helpful because ultimately you're trying to build a perfect hand of cards for when you get to Kansas City so you can ship out those cattle. You can see those cow cards down there. You're trying to do your best to get a variety of them so that you can make a solid sale at the end there. I really love the flow of this game. I love the systems in place and I just love the theme. What a blast. Great game. My number four, Great Western Trail. Now, number three goes to a wonderful engine building game. This is Terraforming Mars. Terraforming Mars is fantastic. It's an engine builder where you take control of a corporation, doing your best to terraform the planet. Game's over when the planet is full on oxygen, heat, and there is enough oceans on the planet for it to be livable. Each round, you're going to be getting patents for projects that you can potentially play to help terraform Mars. And you want to play these cards in a way that not only are you developing your own personal engine that'll carry you through the game, but you're also able to do some immediate impactful effects onto the ship shared board. This game's a lot about timing and preparation and evaluation of those cards, and that's my favorite thing about this game are the cards themselves. I love that at the start of each round you get cards in your hand and you have to decide and make a commitment if to, you want to keep these cards. So each card you keep is going to cost you money, so do you keep these with the potential of playing them or do you just let them go and you know don't even think about it? I really like how you have that tough choice and each card is going to do something drastically different. Every card is unique, and I think that is so cool about this. The iconography is also very simple, but there's also clarification on every card, so it's very easy to know what's going on. If you are playing this game, I do recommend you play with the Prelude expansion. It's going to get your corporation started right away, and you're also going to want to use the draft variant because it allows you to see more cards, and it makes that tension of picking cards that more intense because now you have these options, but you're only allowed to pick one very straightforward, very awesome game. I love the engine building in this one. That's my number three, Terraforming Mars. Number two goes to the worker placement game Feast for Odin by Uwe Rosenberg. Now this game is super fantastic. It's like the epitome of the worker placement genre in my opinion. I think this one is absolutely wonderful. In this one you play as a clan of Vikings and it's your job to use these huge amount of worker spots, putting your characters on these places in order to get these tetromino pieces that you'll be putting onto your different spaces. As you can see here, you have all these negative points on these different shapes, and it's your job to find pieces that are going to fit nicely and hopefully cover them all. So this is a nice end game scoring here, but you're also going to want to get islands so that way you can kind of expand your clan and get new sources of income and powers. I think this game is so fantastic. What a blast. This is one that I could sit and play for hours. Now, that being said, my favorite part about this game has to be the cards. So in this game, you have not only these uh, fighting cards, which are weapons that you can use to mitigate your dice rolls, but you can also get these project cards, and those are my favorite. I love the career cards in this game. You have all sorts of different options, and the game comes with three sets of these cards, so you can mix and match or add new ones if you want to up your complexity and just kind of change up the game. I think it's really cool. There are one-time effects, continuous bonuses, so awesome. I love the card system in here because they're tiny incremental things that, uh, very much like a civilization game, if you build them early, you're going to use them a whole bunch, and it's really going to change the way you play and affect you as a whole throughout the game. I really like this. Now I do recommend that you do play with the Norwegian expansion because not only does it uh, make a tighter experience and change the boards up on the spaces, but it also helps out some of the expansions. Uh, sorry, it also helps out some of the strategies in the game. And it's also going to let you play more of those cards, which I think is really awesome. So that is my number two, A Feast for Odin. 
And lastly, we go to my number one, which is Arkham Horror, the card game. Now, this is an extremely thematic game where you play as a detective, an investigator of some sort, searching into the occult mysteries of the world that you find yourself in. You have some type of campaign that you're going to be going on. It's usually about eight missions long. And when you go into this campaign, you're going to build a deck at the start. This deck is going to take you from mission to mission. At the end of each mission, you can spend any XP you've gained to get new cards for your deck. And that is so, so fun. The mission themselves though are super awesome. You have these cards that represent locations, enemies, things that you meet on the encounter, but ultimately you're telling this big story and you're doing your best to complete objectives in order to ultimately save the universe or maybe just your little town. So you're doing your best to kind of prevent the evils from rushing into the world and you're going to do this in a very customizable, very interesting, very tense way. And I really like this. I love the deck construction. I love everything about this. Uh, one thing that I haven't mentioned a lot in this channel, though, when talking about Arkham Horror, the card game, are some of my favorite cards, the weaknesses. So each character has their own unique weakness, but you're also going to get a random basic weaknesses to change up the game. Now, the cool thing about this is when you draw them from your deck, the weakness happens. So you have no idea what's going to happen. It's pretty scary. And a lot of these can be pretty detrimental. Like some may have you discard all your cards in your hand. Some may be all your money, all your resources. Some of these things might make you cursed. And some, based on the campaign, may carry on from mission to mission and be things that you really want to take care of. Like this cover up here, if you don't deal with it, it's going to make you get some mental trauma, which can eventually kill you, which is very scary. So I love this system here. And I love how the campaign can introduce more weaknesses throughout the campaign to make it more difficult for the investigators. I really like the weakness system. And I think it's a great way to customize and really change up the experience. What a blast. I love Arkham Horror the Card Game. Probably one of my favorite storytelling games in just the board game zeitgeist. Absolutely wonderful. That's my number one. And that's my list. What do you think of my choices? I'd love to hear your favorite games from 2016. I know there were a lot of games that didn't miss this list barely. Things like Scythe, I also enjoy, but just barely missed this list. Also things like Mechs vs. Minions, I also really enjoy. Oh, what a great year. 2016 was a great year for board games. So what do you think? Do you agree with any of my picks? Have you played any of these? I'd love to hear what you think. Thank you so much for watching. Side Game Strong.